Welcome to the Moscone Center, everybody. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's flagship production. This is our sixth year at VMworld. We're in Moscone North this year. Uh, David Flynn is here. He's the CEO of Primary Data, longtime guest, uh, entrepreneur, uh, founder. David, it's always a pleasure to see you. Good Welcome to see you back too, to theCUBE. Glad to be here on theCUBE again. So, you know, like we're here, home. things just keep getting bigger and bigger, right? VMworld, 23,000 oh, people. Um, you're doing another, you know, amazing startup that we're going to talk about, but uh, first of all, you look great. Thank you. How do you feel? Uh, I feel awesome. I, I, I feel awesome, and part of that's because now I've, I give the C, CEO to, to Lance. Yeah. You know, got a lot of the team from Fusion IO here together, and, and now I get to focus on the technology as CTO. Right, so I said CTO, we talked about it beforehand, but yes, yeah. CTO of primary data, although, so you, you, you founded, yeah. now this is your at least second company that I've been watching and yep. very successful, you know, Fusion IO, we saw the innovations that occurred there and now you're on to your, your next startup, Primary Data. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about what Primary Data is doing. One of the more interesting startups that we've seen in a while, you're solving a very, Thank very you. challenging problem. Um, basically the way I describe it is a, is a platform for management, data management for the cloud, uh, and you're, you're approaching it in a very interesting way, always, always trying to solve hard <laughs> problems, you and Rick. So describe primary data, let's get into it. I really well, want to help our audience understand actually this, it. This is kind of a continuation of what got started with the introduction of Flash in the enterprise. Kind of proved that the uh, managing data via the storage silo was unable to address the full dynamic range of storage from the ultra performance that you can get from flash, especially server side flash, near to my heart, and uh, the ultra capacity that you can get from cloud storage and, and object based storage. Those things can't be put into the silo. So the days of, of siloing data have to come to an end, but that creates chaos if you're trying to manage data in different storage systems because the identity of the data is trapped in with it. So what we have done is we have basically freed data from the silo by taking the metadata and the control plane and being able to serve that from the side, not with a box in the middle that reroutes the data, but a, a service we call DataSphere which manages all of the metadata and control channel, that combined with a universal client that's able to speak all of the various protocols and route the data natively and direct, whether it's over fiber channel, local attached, or out over the cloud. This ultimately lets us solve the fundamental uh, problem in storage of being able to, to bring together, doesn't matter the protocol, doesn't matter the connectivity, all of these into a single global data space uh, across which the data is fluidly mobile and maintains its identity. See, today when you, when you take a piece of data from one silo to another, it's not the same piece of data, it's a different piece of data. And we're trying to manage data, not the storage. And yet, managing it via the silo means that we have this issue call it the identity crisis. So when I create data, data has value. Some mm -hmm. data has more value, some data has less value, some data I need to back up, some data I don't really care, some data uh -huh. I need to have high performance. The characteristics of that, that access will change over time and the, the challenge that we've, we've had as an industry is there's been no way to manage that fluidly throughout the infrastructure. And some have tried to do it within their silos, but essentially that metadata that you talked about, if I understand it correctly, has been locked inside of boxes. Correct. And what you're doing is taking an approach to free that metadata and right. then leverage it and creating a value-based infrastructure out of it. So talk a little bit more about that, how you do that. Well, you know, the, the, the implements of getting the data virtualized, and by that I mean abstracting the location of the data away to where you, as a data administrator, see it as the same piece of data no matter where it resides, and the application uh, can reference it no matter where it resides, and even reference it while it's moving, okay? So that's, that's the underlying platform of data virtualization is to abstract the location. But that's really only the beginning, because once you've done that, uh, now you have to schedule where should the data be at any precise point in time. And that's where we're able to move to a world of objective-based data management, where you put uh, uh, the, re the requirements that the data needs on the storage infrastructure are expressed through the language of objectives, which are mated to the service levels that are available in the infrastructure. 
and that's how it determines where things should be placed and moved. Right. So, so, so very, very ambitious. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. So D David, you know, we're here at VMworld, and I mean, we spent the last decade trying to fix that, uh, you know, the challenges we had of managing storage in a virtualized environment. And yes. gosh, I mean, when I joined Wikibon five years ago, David Floyer was saying, it's the metadata, it's the metadata, but <laughs> the metadata is tough. Does it happen automatically? Uh, and, and, and I've seen, you know, I, I really like what I'm hearing from what you guys are doing. The networking guys that I track are trying to, you know, understand what's happening with analytics. Yes. Um, but it, it's a very different, you're, you're flipping the mindset. It's not about storing it, it's about the data, it's about That's information. Right. It, so it's, for it's the, the data for the Virtualization community, matters. you know, we've got all these, you know, virtualization admins, you know, can they grasp this? Well, Are know, they ready for this? We're already familiar yeah. with the concept of, of abstracting the logical from the physical. Now yeah. we work with logical machines, virtual machines, separate from the physical, and they can be instantiated on any piece of physical hardware, uh, shut down, move somewhere else. The lifetime of that virtual machine is no longer coupled to the physical. What we're doing is finally doing the same thing for the data objects, where those data objects uh, can live on this piece of storage, that piece of storage, doesn't matter the vendor, doesn't ma matter the protocol, can be object file or block, doesn't matter how it's accessed, it can be object file or block accessed, but the data is able to fluidly move between the different types of storage. So I think people familiar with virtualization get the concept and inherently understand the value of that decoupling of the logical layer from the physical. It just hadn't been done yet in the storage world. We've been too stuck on making bigger silos or trying to stretch the data out front of the silo with a catch, or stretch it out back with backup and archival, or stretch it horizontally with scale out. These are all expressions of the same underlying problem, but each of those are just fixing a symptom. Caching is trying to tap into lower cost performance by lending the data out front. Uh, backup and archival is trying to tap into cheaper capacity by lending it out back. It's just the immobility of data that's really at the heart of all of these. So I want to describe my perfect world, and knowing you, you're going to make my world even better, and it's because I'll probably miss a few things. But so, I would like when, when a you know, data is created, I would like attributes uh, associated with that data to, to be tied to that data, ideally, automatically, and, yep. and then uh, assigned and applied so that the policies, I'll use that sort of mm -hmm. outdated term, uh, can determine where it goes, you know, how often it's backed up, all kinds of different you know, things, how many copies I need, et cetera, yep. et cetera, when I need to defensively delete it. And, and as the attributes of that environment change, as the data changes, as the characteristics change, I want you to take action on that, that That's right. data. Can your system do that? Is that the vision? Is that available you know, so, near term, mid term, so, long term? Absolutely, absolutely. First, it's the fact that we have split the control plane from the data access plane that allow us to add the sophistication in the control plane that you're talking about. See, today, storage is broken because the metadata and the data are commingled, and the same agent which resolves a piece of metadata has to subsequently route all of it. That's as if your DNS server had to proxy all of your traffic to Google. The internet wouldn't scale if you had to have your DNS servers proxying the traffic. Yet storage is like that today. The same thing that opens the file, foo, has to pass all the data to it. So fundamentally, by splitting the control plane, we no longer have that false dichotomy of having to choose performance in the data path or sophistication in the control plane. But once you've now freed up the control plane to be more sophisticated, now you can introduce a language to make it easier to manage those things. And we talk about that as the language of objectives. These are the, the intents of the data. What, is, what does it need? And all of the things you listed, whether it be durability, availability, security, uh, all of these things drive the physical placement of the data. So if you say I need higher durability, it might have to put multiple copies. If you say I need disaster recovery, it might need to put some of those copies off site. All of the placement is done in uh, response to uh, trying to meet the, these more abstract objectives. So we talk about objective-based data management. Okay, and you have knowledge, you've got you know, things like catalogs that can help me understand where it is, you know, mm -hmm. where, yep, yep. where it's That's moving all around. The metadata. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, okay, so you are the, the control point. Now, so your, your vision is for cloud, obviously, we're in, live in a cloud world. Um, talk about how you're going to market, maybe partnerships that you have. How do you get this product out there? Is it direct well, you know, sales, or do I buy it? Do I, is it a service? You know, there, there's awesome opportunities for this to solve real pain points and real immediate pain points because uh, most organizations are faced with the question of how do I take advantage of the goodness of Flash 
when I operate in a siloed fashion, Flash is too expensive to be the one silo, right? So maybe I use Flash as a cache, but now I'm introducing caching technologies, yet more stuff to manage, these point solutions. Uh, on the flip side, saying, look at how cheap and deep I can get object storage, and even if I'm only using it for my archival tier, but then I have to introduce you know, these cloud gateways or, or methodologies for moving the data, and those are point solutions that are yet more things for IT to manage. With this, we connect all the way from the cloud through your, what is today the traditional primary storage systems all the way into server local and make those all one data space where you don't have to manage them with these separate point solutions. But to get more concrete on the go-to-market, um, VMware with vSphere 6 has introduced the concept of vVols as a way to kind of normalize the storage infrastructure. But every storage vendor is going to have their own uh, VASA2 provider and, and, uh, and vVols implementation if you're lucky enough to get one. Because yeah. there's $300 billion of already installed storage equipment supporting virtual environments. A good portion of that will never support vVols. Mm. But with primary data able to envelop all of those storage systems and virtualize the data across them, we become the universal uh, VVOL provider, providing VASA 2.0 uh, in a uniform fashion, regardless of the storage, whether it's file, block, object, what have you. You don't care what the storage infrastructure is, and you obviously have a high-speed data mover that, that exactly. can that's, that's, <laughs> get the data where it needs to be. I mean, correct, that's, correct. That's in, yeah. implied. Right? So, uh, I'm wondering, those that you know, have been tracking storage for years to look at it, there were a lot of failed attempts at you know, storage virtualization, or you know, software-defined storage, we spent a couple of years talking yeah, about yeah. it and saying, maybe this is kind of the next but, generation. But those are technologies, yeah. not really solving the solutions. You're making bigger silos from smaller silos. Even yes. hyperconverged is just making a bigger silo of your data, a bigger prison. We had, uh, I, I loved the, the, the fun uh, competition with EMC when we were part of Fusion IO, being the little upstart, right? And EMC folks would tell the customer, yeah, that Fusion IO stuff, it's great, but it's an island of data that's trapped in your server and unmanageable. And when we would talk to these same customers, they would say, boy, that's the pot calling the kettle black <laughs> because that sand is this island of data in the middle of my data center. <laughs> Just a big stuck. island. <laughs> yeah, it's the same problem, whether in miniature or macro, it's the fact that, that the data can't fluidly move across these things while being accessed with the same identity. Yeah. So what about, what about Public Cloud, Amazon, Azure, where do they fit into your vision? Well, we think of this uh, on two dimensions. One, of course, is using the cloud storage as, uh, as an extension of your uh, global data space that happens to have maybe very slow access characteristics, but very, very cheap and very deep. Somebody else can manage it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we connect to, uh, to cloud and object storage, whether it's on-premise object storage or cloud. Just another target to you. Right. And if the objective on the data allows for it, or necessitates it to be off-site and archival, then it may get posted up in the cloud. When you go to access it, it may pull it back down, right? So it's just another uh, tier, another uh, storage uh, with, with different service levels that can be used to meet the objectives. That's the cloud storage side. Um, the cloud compute side, that's where our data sphere and the, uh, the agents that are needed can run uh, on virtual appliances, or actually even as software appliances if you want to run them bare metal in, in cloud as well. So by, by being able to deploy this as a software-defined kind of model, now you can put it up into the compute infrastructure and create this uh, virtualized uh, data in the cloud where you're unifying file block and object and expressing it as file block or object. Let's, let's talk about the company a little bit. So you're a California-based company. Uh, yes. where, where are your alpha, ge alpha geeks? Uh, <laughs> where are they located and where are you getting them from? Well, you know, we have teams. Other than you. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that. We have a very, super talented team. In the most it's respectful really, way. Really, thank you. <laughs> we have a super talented team. We've got uh, engineering uh, uh, centers of excellence uh, here in, uh, in the Bay Area, just uh, in Palo Alto, border to Los Altos on El Camino Real, and we have uh, offices in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, a lot of storage talent there, mm. uh, and uh, of course, uh, my homeland in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, where we started Fusion IO back in the day. A lot of lot of engineering talent there, uh, and and we have a very distributed team too. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I think, at this point, uh, two official Linux kernel maintainers, guys who are gatekeepers on what goes into Linux around the uh, NFS 
stack and the SMB stack, uh, as well as uh, a very distributed team all the way from China to, uh, to Europe that are uh, you know, part of this distributed, uh, it's the culture that comes from the Linux community, well, right? <laughs> and, and of course you were very active at Fusion IO in contributions to, right. to Linux. I mean, we have had interesting discussions about how everybody forgot about paging and then how important <laughs> yeah. it became after Flash was injected yeah, yeah, into the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, this is very intimate at the, with, what we've done is we've driven all of this in the standards body by leveraging uh, the extensions to NFS so that we can elevate all of these other types of storage to have the full file system kind of metadata where we can express objectives. So you're not working with these ethereal LUNs that are floating off nowhere. These are you know, tethered in a namespace where you, can, where you can see them. Even though they're block underneath and they're consumed as block, they can show up in a file system namespace and without slowing down the access. That's the beauty. There's no longer the, the false choice of having to choose the sophistication of NAS with a nice namespace or the performance of SAN with with high performance block, get both. Yeah, yeah. So, so by splitting the control plane and the data plane. David, I, I'm curious. When you have a solution like this, over time, the customer can make changes to what storage they're using underneath. So yes. I wonder if you can kind of paint a picture as to how you see, you know, well, kind of the, the, the storage now, environment look with, in the future. With server virtualization, we've yeah. decoupled management of the physical servers from the logical servers. That has made both jobs much easier, right? The same is true here, because now you can decommission, you can stage new uh, hardware, you can take it down for servicing, and you can do all of that without interrupting service. Yeah. Because with data virtualization, if the data needs to move somewhere else to maintain its availability objectives, it will. So all you have to do is advertise that this storage system is not going to be able to provide availability because oh. you're going to take it down yeah. and the data will automatically migrate somewhere else yeah. and you can service it. Uh, so I now mean, you can service the physical without having to worry about interrupting yeah, Just a point on that, David Floyer you know, said very conservatively, you know, we spend at least 30% of the storage budget on migrations, just getting exactly. it on, getting it off, this and that's low hanging fruit problem. to us to just save huge amounts of money uh, when it comes that's to our right. infrastructure. That's right, so you could be talking about a C mode migration yeah. with NetApp, uh, this makes it seamless where you don't have to, to take it offline and copy data around. So just in the last couple of minutes, uh, some non-CTO questions, but I know you know the answer. So um, you guys, uh, uh, Excel partners, other, other investors, who are the battery. investors, how much battery, how much have you raised, you know, where are you at, what's your headcount these days, what can you share with us? So we raised uh, 63 million uh, almost two years ago when we first got the thing started. Uh, about 75 people at this point in time, almost entirely engineering and uh, product. Um, we uh, have a number of strategic investors, and I'm not sure I'm free to, to, to speak to them, but folks on the supply side uh, and, uh, and folks on the, the distribution side of things, so uh, a, good, a good blend there. And then a number of uh, individual investors that, you know, folks that uh, were part of Fusion IO, uh, founded lots of the, the brand name storage companies that you're familiar with in the past uh, are also part of this one as well as individual investors. And product availability, where are you at? So uh, we're announcing the product this week. We announced the product this week. We're in, uh, in the, the early access with, uh, with uh, proof of concept customers. Probably going to take that through uh, to the end of the year before GA. We're targeting the enterprise market to start with, going after the high ground. Um, you can always, you know, uh, go down into SMB, but you have to have your your shit together. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure okay. I can say that. <laughs> you can say that. In the okay, queue. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Before you go into into uh, enterprise, so we're holding ourselves to a high standard, like we did with Fusion IO. Yeah, I got to tell you my John Cleese story off camera. And then, um, <laughs> and then the product is called uh, what's the so Data Sphere. Yeah. Okay. Is the name of the uh, the the uh, metadata control plane, uh, and that's deployable as a virtual appliance or as a physical appliance and as a highly available couplet. So you can do it software defined or you can do it with hardware where you get the maximum in performance and availability. Excellent, all right David, we'll have to leave it right there. Thanks so much for coming back. And Thank you. Congratulations on uh, your next startup. Big, big lift as we say. <laughs> and uh, it's just awesome to problems. watch it. Really fantastic to see you again. Thank you so much. All right, keep right Thanks, there everybody. David. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is theCUBE at VMworld 2015, right back. <laughs>